Live from Ogasawara, this is the Monster Island Film Vault, Episode 10, John LeMay vs. King Kong Lives. Hello, kaiju lovers, and welcome to the Monster Island Film Vault, a podcast seeking entertainment and enlightenment through tokusatsu. I am your host, Nathan Marchan, the curator of this depository of Daikaiju Delights. And with me today, once again, is kaiju author and scholar, John LeMay. What's up, Nathan? It's good to be back. Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> what have you been up to since you were here on the island last? I've been up to a lot of things, but I, the thing that might be relevant to this episode is, if you like Kong Unmade, my book about the unmade King Kong movies, uh, I have a new version. It, there's no new content, but it's uh, a hardback edition. So same book, but just a hardback. So uh, if you like the fact that it was modeled after the old Ian Thorne Monster Series King Kong book, the hardback edition is even more evocative of that. So if you're a really big fan or you haven't picked it up yet, it is available in a hardback. Just thought I'd throw that out there, but that's that's about it. You just finished it, Jimmy? Yeah, he's a big fan. We both have been uh, been reading through that book a lot uh, in preparation for this podcast. Nathan, I thought we agreed that Jimmy would not be on my episodes. What? We did that? I thought we agreed that Jimmy would not just because he and I had a, a spat, but I guess we don't need to talk about that. It's, it's okay. You had a spat? Really? John wanted to have a tour of your garage and you said no? You, you, Jimmy, you jerk. Ugh. We're going to have to have a talk about this after the show. I'm sorry, John. It's okay. It might, it might be Jimmy and I are both kind of like redheads. Oh. Don't, always, don't always get along with our own kind. I don't know. Yeah. Story goes, redheads don't have souls, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but regardless, today you are joining me, as I mentioned uh, during your previous appearance, you you are joining me today to talk about quite possibly the most infamous King Kong movie ever made. <laughs> what I have heard some refer to as the Godzilla versus Megalon of the Kong film series, King Kong Lives. It is legit my favorite King Kong movie. I've probably seen that one more than any of the others. I've never understood why so many people hate it. Maybe we can hash that out. I don't know. I think so. And then after that, going back to some stuff I had alluded to in the previous episode on King Kong 76, our toku topic for today will be what I like to call the convoluted King Kong copyright. See what I did there? Huh? Clever little me? I've been reading I too much it. Stan Lee. I got, I got that reference. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But in the meantime, speaking of Jimmy, <laughs> I have to fulfill my contractual obligations and read his entertaining info dump before we dive in so I can make sure we've got everybody on the same page about this movie. And in the meantime, you and I will go watch the film and through the magic of editing, we will have finished it. <laughs> King Kong is a giant gorilla inexplicably resurrected by scientists using an artificial heart. While he at times is a force of nature, he displays many anthropomorphisms such as affection, rage, and playfulness. He is determined to save and protect his mate, Lady Kong, and later their son from the scientists and the military. Lady Kong is a huge female gorilla found in the African jungle. Like King Kong, she displays many anthropomorphisms like affection and sadness. While at first she tries to escape the humans, she later becomes a damsel in distress waiting to be saved by King Kong. By the end, her goal is to give birth and raise their son, who is sometimes called Baby Kong or Kid Kong in the fandom. Thankfully, his conception is off camera. The little monster simply wants to be loved by his parents. The daring and charming adventurer Hank Mitchell captures Lady Kong and brings her back to the States to give a life-saving blood transfusion to King Kong. When the giant apes escape, his goal is to recapture them in order to protect them from the military. His love interest, the intelligent and compassionate Dr. Amy Franklin, is the scientist heading the operation endeavoring to resurrect King Kong. She is determined to keep the Eighth Wonder alive and protect the pregnant Lady Kong. The insane and gung-ho Lieutenant Colonel Archie Nevitt is hell-bent on killing the apes after they break out of the Scientific Institute. The human and kaiju plotlines are unified. The characters rarely make decisions or take actions that aren't connected to the Kongs in some way. 
While presented in a sympathetic light, the Kongs are the problem. Nevit and his forces corner them in the wilderness where they gas Lady Kong and force King Kong to jump off a cliff into a river. Lady Kong is taken to a military base while King Kong wanders the wilderness, where he is incapacitated by redneck hunters who bury him up to his neck by blowing up the ground with dynamite. King Kong digs out and kills them. Hank and Amy sneak into the base to free the pregnant Lady Kong until King Kong arrives and rescues her. Nevid and his forces battle King Kong while Lady Kong gives birth in a barn, but he destroys them all. The problem is solved when King Kong succumbs to both his wounds and his failing artificial heart. Lady Kong and Baby Kong are then relocated to Borneo to live in peace. The screenplay by Ronald Shusett and Stephen Pressfield is a simple romantic adventure story with little subplot activity and a handful of disposable secondary characters. The film's special effects were once more created by Carlo Rambaldi using many of the same techniques utilized in the 1976 remake, including suitmation, miniatures, backscreen projection, rotoscoping, and blue screens. Rick Baker didn't return to play King Kong, so the role went to costume performer Peter Elliott while Lady Kong was played by George Yasumi. That's right, both apes were played by dudes. King Kong was redesigned from the 1976 film, most notably going from black fur to brown, but the suit wasn't as expressive as the one in that film. While accurate to real female gorillas, the Lady Kong suit design is awkward. The miniature work isn't as convincing as the 1976 King Kong, but it does at points feel like a Japanese kaiju film. Shusett and Pressfield attempted to write a semi-satirical parody and action film a la Raiders of the Lost Ark, but the actors play their role straight, creating a confused and inconsistent tone. Regardless, there is a moderate amount of gravity given to the Kong's plight. Given its outrageous premise and pseudoscience, saying it airs on the side of fantasy would be the understatement of the year. The film was in many ways a radical departure from previous Kong films in that the Eighth Wonder falls in love with a female of his own species. Increasing the fantastical story elements after a grounded first film was a bold but necessary move in order to resurrect King Kong in-universe. It also takes several of the tropes from the previous films, such as King Kong holding a woman, and reverses them by having King Kong pick up Mitchell. While there is some minor reinforcement of style from Son of Kong with Baby Kong, this film established the style by being a kaiju love story, which makes it unusual and unique as both a Kong film and a giant monster movie. While producer Dino De Laurentiis wanted to make a sequel to his 1976 remake of King Kong from the start, no one is sure why he wanted to, except perhaps to capitalize on the confrontation ride at Universal Studios. Regardless, it was meant to be an entertaining romp for general audiences, Kong fans, and monster fans. The film was a box office flop, grossing only $4.7 million, with some estimates at $2.2 million, on an $18 million budget. Critics and audiences alike weren't kind, and the film currently has a 3.9 with 5,091 ratings on IMDb, the lowest of all the Kong films. There are a few forces at play. Science clashes with militarism as scientists and soldiers compete over whether to preserve or kill the giant apes. The rednecks hunt King Kong for sport and bragging rights. King Kong's mating instincts and love for Lady Kong compels him to escape the scientists and run away with her. Civilization battles nature when Nevit and the military attack the Kongs. As silly as the film is, there are themes present. Nevitt represents the stereotypical caricature of a reckless and arrogant military that was becoming more popular at the time. As represented by the film's two couples, King Kong and Lady Kong and Hank and Amy, love is shown to be a powerful positive force. Amy exemplifies altruism and nature conservation by trying to preserve the Kong's lives. Self-sacrifice is displayed by King Kong when he dies defending his family from the military. <sighs> I have fulfilled my contractual obligations thanks to Jimmy's riffs, so let's see if I survive the Toku talk. Okay, John, to paraphrase the popular Steven Crowder meme, King Kong Lives is a terrible movie, changed my mind. I think it's very original. I think that sometimes fans within a community are taught that they shouldn't like a certain movie, like 
when I, I was born in 85, so I came of age into Godzilla and Kong and Gamera, all that, probably in the early 90s, early to mid 90s. And, you know, the fan dogma back then was Godzilla versus Megalon is terrible. Godzilla's revenge is terrible. Those movies have kind of been reappraised since then and have a bit more respect. Now, King Kong Lives, I don't think has ever been reappraised. It still doesn't get any respect. But I think a, a big part of it is people were taught to hate it, or at least the younger generation was taught, you shouldn't like that movie. It's no good. But a big part of that, I would say, is everybody who saw, or the adults who saw King Kong in 1976, they just seemed to hate it because it wasn't the original. It was a big departure. So by default, I think they decided to hate the sequel 10 years later. I think if you have a, a fresh perspective and you haven't been tainted by the fan dogma, I don't see why you couldn't watch King Kong Lives and look at it as a very original, unique monster movie. Because King Kong is very much a character in that movie. You know, he has an arc. He has, like, to me, it's almost like a jailbreak movie with King Kong <laughs> because it's like he has to hide from the law out in the swamps, you know, and like he's got, instead of being infatuated with a human female, I think it, it answers the question, uh, what if Kong actually met a female of his species and he does fall in love and he has a son? And I, I just think it's a really exciting, touching film to me. You're calling it a jailbreak movie. The, I've, I was trying to figure out what would be a good analogy for that. And the first thing that came to my mind was The Great Escape, which is probably not the right one. <laughs> I was thinking more like Cool Hand Luke because Cool Hand Luke was set in the South. And I, I seem to remember scenes of him running through the swamps and trying to get away from the law. And I just think of King Kong in hiding out in the swamps, eating the alligators and all that. <laughs> oh, the, the alligator scene. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That, okay, that's my one thing I don't like that I don't respect. To me, that's the one really bad effect shot. They should not oh. have used that baby alligator. That was a horrible choice. And to me, that's really the only really, really bad, unforgivable effect scene to me. Yeah, when I was watching that, the at first it seemed like it was, well, later on, it's obviously a rubber prop. But then they edit in shots where it looks like they have a like they have a close up of an actual alligator that you know, is reacting to Kong holding it, and then it switches back, and that just looks weird. And I do think there are points where that actor is holding an actual baby alligator, which is not baby alligators look a little bit different than adult alligators, so it just destroys the illusion. Yeah. Unfortunately, I I'm with you there. Although I'll give credit where credit is due, that Kong suit looks better in water than a lot of the other. Kong suits that we've been seeing in other films. Yep. I mean, even the Rick Baker suit in the 76 movie didn't always look good when it was wet. Not as bad as the Toho no. Kongs. The Toho Kongs had a lot of problems when they were wet. Yeah. The genesis of this movie is a little bit crazy, honestly. Uh, you mentioned in Kong on Maid that there were several ideas that got pitched around. I, it, D De Laurentiis, from what I can tell, was in a lot of ways kind of like another Marion C. Cooper or, or even like a real-life Carl Denham. He was quite the showman and you know, was apparently was, really, yeah. really charismatic and enthusiastic about all the stuff that he was doing and was bantering about all these different ideas. Although, I have to admit, there was this funny exchange that he had with Jeff Bridges when they were working on the previous one. The story goes as you mentioned in Kong on Made, that he went to Jeff Bridges and said, I've got two words for you, Kong 2. And Bridges replied with, and I've got two words for you. And we'll just leave it at that because we're a family show. <laughs> it could have just been heck no, he, you know, but I doubt it. Yeah, <laughs> just, just saying. I'm trying to remember what some of the titles were that they were toying with. I know one was King Kong in Africa, which would have been... Something of a like a Frankenstein sort of a sort of a story, but set in Africa yeah. where it was King Kong getting patched back together by a mad scientist or something. There were four different concepts and all four of them inevitably had to be like King Kong lives, which is King Kong just fell off the Empire State Building. So you have to fix them. All of them did revolve around King Kong being revived in some way. Even supposedly King Kong versus Orca, which is one of the crazier ones. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, wait, that was yeah. Uh, De Laurentiis's kind of ripoff of Jaws, except it was a killer whale. Yeah, De, De Laurentiis made Orca, and so he just thought, well, why don't we do King Kong versus Orca? There was some sort of weird legal hang-up where if De Laurentiis did get to do a sequel to his King Kong, he would need... Universal Studios approval, which is strange. Universal Studios made Jaws, therefore they hated Orca. So King <laughs> Kong versus Orca would have never happened. 
for that Universal reason. was kind of De Laurentiis's nemesis there for a while, yeah. <laughs> as well. You'll find out a little yeah, bit more were. in the next segment when we talk about the copyright. But my gosh, yeah. But um, so one thing about De Laurentiis, you know, somebody right away pitched, "Oh, well, let's just do Son of Kong for the next movie," and he was like, "No, I, I want King Kong in the movie." But his plans for the sequels, he'd never imagined waiting 10 years to do the next one. He was already thinking, I've got this giant prop that Carlo Rombaldi had built. Uh, I want to use it in a sequel to get some more mileage out of it. So he was thinking about shooting the sequel, which was King Kong in Africa, within the next year. And I don't know why that didn't happen or what stopped him. I mean, if he did it 10 years later, why not do it a year later? I I really don't know why it took so long. But It is surprising because King Kong 76 made money, made plenty of money. It did, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so I that's a mystery to me why it took so long. But aside from King Kong versus Orca, there were three titles, you know, King Kong in Africa, King Kong in Moscow, and Bionic Kong. And they all <laughs> seem to revolve around, <laughs> yeah. I, fr- I, I honestly know. feel yeah. like Bionic Kong eventually led to this in some way, shape, or form. And as absurd oh, yeah. as uh, the concept of Bionic Kong is, I think actually I would have really enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I would have really enjoyed King Kong versus Orca's crazy as that sounds but so you know well didn't that kind yeah, of happen all... though what was uh the movie ape didn't they do that? ape yeah, <laughs> yeah where, he's, where they have this really awful looking guy in an ape suit fighting a clearly rubber shark you know the more i think about it since universal owned kong for a while which we'll get into later and they own jaws i'm really hacked that universal didn't just do king kong versus jaws because i think everybody wanted to see it yeah. it would have been crazy But, I mean, would it have been any crazier than Jaws stalking Ellen Brody in the Bahamas like he did in Jaws 4? But going back to some of the other actors, this was funny. I read this story in the the Ray Morton book, King Kong, A History of a Movie Icon. And we already talked about De Laurentiis trying to pitch a sequel to Jeff Bridges. He also tried to pitch it to Jessica Lange. But she didn't want to do it, and I just thought this was hilarious. De Laurentiis joked at one point that he was going to have Semple, Lorenzo Semple, who wrote the the script for King Kong 76. We were at a scene where they actually do bring Dwan back, and now she's a a movie star, to see the resurrected Kong, and then Kong picks her up and eats her. (laughs) I know, that was was crazy. (laughs) I was like, wow. That's one way to do it. Uh, Jessica Lange will never want to work with you ever again after that. Yeah. Oh, you're going to kill off my character by having King Kong eat me. That's great. (laughs) Oh, man, that cracked me up. I have to admit, looking over my notes on this film and a huge chunk of them look like the script for a Mystery Science Theater 3000s episode. (laughs) A script for one of those because I was just cracking so many jokes watching it. And actually, some of them are from my live tweets for my personal Twitter, my author Twitter, when I watched this movie the first time, actually, over the summer, because as you mentioned, its reputation precedes it. And when I knew I was going to get this job here on the island, I said, well, I have to watch it. So I tracked down a copy. Had you, had you never seen it? No, I hadn't before oh, this I summer. So I tracked down, it. so I finally okay. tracked down a copy and I watched it for the first time. And I said, I'm going to live tweet as I watch it and I'll share some of my zing because it's a highly riffable movie. But as I've said before, I riff because I love. (laughs) (laughs) But it's interesting. We've both noted that the reception to King Kong 76 has at points turned kind of sour and negative. But when the movie was originally released, it did actually really well with critics. Not this one. Not this one at all. This one has had a bad reputation from day one because they showed it to some test audiences The test audiences didn't like it, but they didn't have time to make any major changes. Hmm. So they just toned down the advertising for it and then just put the movie out, kind of put it out quietly. So not a lot of people even knew it was out and weren't seeing it. And then those who did see it were disappointed. I actually tracked down on YouTube the video of Siskel and Ebert on their show reviewing this movie. And not surprisingly, they didn't like it. But not only that, they said even the studio doesn't have faith in this movie because they wouldn't let them show clips of it. Wow. Or rather, they said, you can show clips for your local show, but not your national show. And they said the only time they've ever had 
movies or movie studios, I should say, who did that with them were the bad schlocky films because they were afraid that negative reviews would kill what little chance they had of making money. And Ebert even joked that the door to the theater was more popular than the movie. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> people bad. were getting up and leaving. <laughs> so, yeah, they they were not kind. But it was that was an interesting time capsule. I can't think and of yet, any other time that happened on their show. And yet Ebert likes Super Inframan, which I have to admit I saw as an adult, so I couldn't appreciate it through the eyes of a child. But then again, neither could Ebert. He loves that movie. And, like, I watched Super Inframan, and I was – entertained but kind of bored like I, I didn't get how he could give that high marks and, and then ebert also hated tidal wave which i don't think is too bad of a film so I, I i don't have a lot of faith in ebert's tastes and monster movies aside from his his uh positive review of gamma guardian of the universe i and I don't even know about that ebert. was a little bit of a qualified appreciation because he appreciated it as in his mind as a good b movie when mm-hmm. i watched guardian of the universe and i say this is not a b movie no absolutely not (laughs) i mean maybe compared to the two sequels because that series gets progressively better as it goes but you know so maybe it's the lesser of the three but my gosh no that's not a b movie i've just always felt like some people get way too hung up on the special effects and that might have been part of the problem with king kong lives is you've got I wouldn't say outdated effects. There was really nothing else you could do in 1986. You know, CGI was still in its infancy. Suits was all you could do. And I think people just can't accept two people in ape suits that are in love with each other. I think that's the main problem. But I I almost think that's almost a sign of immaturity. I, I don't know how else to say it. You know, I, I can accept the fact that maybe the effects aren't top notch, but that doesn't take me out of the story as a writer but that's just me now now a really really bad movie like plan nine from outer space or something (laughs) where the effects are really bad sure i'll laugh at it but like i've never understood the people that just hee-haw and laugh at godzilla movies you know i understood that they did the best that they could and I, i feel like king kong lives actually did the best that it could so i i don't know i think that's why a lot of people don't like it too is just that concept with those effects it could be that i also do think that but what I've been reading, and I definitely noticed this when we watched the movie tonight, which was the tone is a little bit all over the place. It doesn't seem to quite know. Not even all the actors seem to really know what kind of a movie they were going for. Now, when De Laurentiis was consulting with Ronald Shusett, who was the screenwriter on this, interestingly enough, they were trying to go for a Raiders of the Lost Ark sort of a tone. Let me explain. Hmm. So they wanted to do something that was semi-satirical. The way Shusit put it was that he said, quote, I once read that Raiders was a spoof of an action movie, but at the same time, it was also an action movie. That was exactly what I was going for, but that's a hard pin to hit, end quote. And I do think that is definitely the case. (laughs) Because you can see it in this. There are points where it is trying really hard to be tongue-in-cheek, even more so than the 76 movie. The 76 movie had a little bit of a satirical edge to it and some self-aware humor, but this one at points tries to be out-and-out parody. Problem was is that a lot of the actors were in this film, from what I was reading, were still playing it straight and didn't quite understand what they were going for, which is a little bit surprising considering it, this has the same director, believe it or not, as the 76 film, Gullerman. And... Yep. It would be an interesting case study to look at why this film feels so different when it's the same director. Now, mind you, 10 years had passed and a lot of things had happened in Gullerman's personal life. You know, his son had died and things like that. You know, his career was on a little bit of a slide after this. You know, he didn't direct a lot of movies after this and, you know, went more into television and such from what I was reading. But still, you know, some people have said it, it doesn't quite have the same f- flair that he would normally have in his films. I mean, this is the guy who also did the towering Inferno and things like that. Yeah, and I'm not surprised De Laurentiis back then went for a disaster movie director to do Kong. I think that was a very wise choice. That was a big reason why he wanted to make the movie in the first place is because of the disaster movie craze that was going on at the time. Yeah. One of the challenges that Shusett said he had to figure out with this film was De Laurentiis said, I want Kong back. And he had to figure out some way to bring Kong back. And he said the only way he could think of to do it was in some sort of fantastical way. Because there's no way you're realistically going to make this happen. 
Yep. Which is why I honestly, in a way, I think the Bionic Kong thing actually would have been a little easier to swallow. But instead, he, he didn't want to do something quite that outrageous. And at this point, 1982, there were headlines being made because Dr. Robert Jarvik had created the first artificial heart. So because of uh, that, interesting. Yeah. So because of that, Shu said use that in the script, even though he said it was too bizarre and funny to be played straight. <laughs> and even I was thinking. Well, I remember for the longest time I didn't want to watch this movie because when I heard it's like, okay, how do they bring Kong back from the dead? Oh, it's an artificial heart. Yeah, because artificial hearts cure falling off a building. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Really, Jimmy? You've seen it work for, for other monsters besides Kong? There's some interesting stories for you. Mr. NASA engineer over here believes in magic artificial hearts. Anyway, so that's kind of the big hurdle you have to get over when you start watching this movie. <laughs> it's, you have to buy into this concept. <laughs> See, but I feel like it's like he's already a giant ape which can't possibly exist. I mean, it's already out there. I, yeah. I don't know. I, I feel like, yeah, in these movies you throw reality out the door right away. Yeah, you do. Although it is still a little bit jarring because I felt like, and some people actually felt the same way going from Godzilla 2014 to King of the Monsters. It feels like this was a big jump. There is some elements of fantasy in King Kong 76, but this one goes straight off into fantasy land. <laughs> Yep. You know, it's it's a huge jump compared to the previous one, which is why, which in some ways is really interesting because the beginning of this movie is stock footage. It's a flashback. Yeah. I even wrote in my notes, even King Kong is not immune to stock footage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And my other note was, mind you, this is before I had re-evaluated my thoughts on King Kong 76. <laughs> I wrote in my, I wrote in, this is one of my live tweets as well. I wrote in my notes, previously on a mediocre remake... <laughs> <laughs> I don't consider 76 to be mediocre anymore, just so everyone understands. Please listen to that episode if you haven't already. <laughs> episode 8. <laughs> but the movie starts making these very direct connections to 76, and then it more or less gets forgotten after that. Because <laughs> we have a completely new set of characters, and it's a completely different kind of story. <laughs> Maybe you can help me with this, John, but there is one major plot hole in this movie that still kind of bugs me, which is why are they keeping Kong alive? Nowhere do they ever explain why they are bothering to keep this giant ape alive for 10 years, essentially on life would, support. Yeah. I, there's nothing so, anywhere that anyone says. I'm like, I'll take a bad explanation over no explanation. I feel like all these giant monster movies typically have a conflict between the scientists and the military, starting with the original Godzilla. You know, Dr. Yamane wants to study Godzilla and the military wants to kill him. I feel like it's the same thing. You know, so there's a group, and that's present in this movie as well. The scientists all want to save Kong no matter how destructive he is, whereas the military just wants to kill him. My thinking is right after he fell off the Empire State Building, some scientists with some sort of government support must have gotten a hold of Kong, and that's how I look at it my the plot hole for me is um how does the bionic heart keep going because wouldn't they need to like charge it with the battery every once in a while or something like i don't know <laughs> well I, unfortunately i don't know a whole lot about yeah. <laughs> artificial hearts let alone artificial hearts in the 80s you know that might be a, a question for jimmy uh, you, you might look into that a little bit for your Jimmy's notes on this episode. Sounds like a good idea. But th it does come in. They mention that, which I find a little bit ironic because you have Linda Hamilton as our heroine in this film. You know, we'll talk about her a little bit later. And she actually says that uh, something about with her computer, she had to input a code or something in it to keep the, the heart going. And then the irony is that while she's trying to set it up, Kong walks toward them and then steps on the yeah. computer. So he essentially seals his own fate. <laughs> Although when you get to the end of this movie, it's never really explained what actually kills him because he suffered incredible wounds fighting the military, but they yeah. were already setting it up like the heart was going to give out. So I'm like, so what actually kills him at the end? Because I don't know. <laughs> 
Well, you brought up the characters, you know, Linda Hamilton is, is Amy and Brian Kerwin is Mitch. And I can't remember who plays Colonel Nevitt. But what I like about this movie is it, it brings back the three main character tropes from the King Kong mythos in a different way. You know, because typically you've always got your Jack Driscoll, your Ann Darrow and your Carl Denham. So to me, what I think is neat is they switched them around. To me, Linda Hamilton is more like the Jack Driscoll. She's more the proactive one who takes uh, action and bosses people around, tells them what to do. She's the one, you know, trying to save Kong. Whereas Brian Kerwin's Mitch character to me is actually more like Ann Darrow. He's not an actor, but he, he's like uh, Ann Darrow in that a lot of publicity is focused on him. He's re- kind of renowned for being charming and good looking, you know, like an actor would be. And he's the one that the ape gets infatuated with. You know, we've got a female ape infatuated with a male human, which I'm sure some people thought was funny. I, I, that's another touch that I like. And then Colonel Nevitt is maybe like a darker version of Carl Denham because he's the one who's uh, got the ape chained up and uh, he's kind of sort of a villain. Of course, Carl Denham wasn't really a villain in the original film, but Charles Grodin's version of Denham called Fred Wilson, he was kind of sort of looked on as a villain. So that, that's one thing I really respect about King Kong Lives is how it took those same tropes and they, they reversed the genders uh, on a couple of them. I, I just thought that was cool. Well, yeah, and I will admit, It's one of those things where I think a lot of stuff about this movie works on paper, but I don't think, me personally, I don't think the execution was quite there (laughs) with some of them. I do like the idea of the gender reversal. It's a little bit subversive. Some might say a little bit progressive for its time. And it sounded like in previous versions of the script, they wanted to amp that up a little bit more than what they ended up doing. Ooh, tell tell me more when you get a chance because that's something I've never heard. So please, yeah, it's in the, yeah, it's in the, it's, yeah, it's in the Ray Morton book. The like they were okay. gonna have a Lady Kong. It's Lady Kong, not Queen Kong, because we already had a Queen yeah. Kong. Huh. <laughs> you know, so we had to come up with another title, and she was going to become infatuated with a with a big male hunter who was out to get her, and then do all the same things that Kong did with Anne or Dwan in the previous films, carrying him around and all that. And the idea was that it was supposed to make King Kong jealous, (laughs) which sounds incredibly silly, but it would have been very entertaining. A lot of that ended up going by the wayside, but they did keep some elements of it, you know, because Brian Kerwin still gets picked up and carried by Lady Kong at one point. And, you know, they used the big hand prop like they did before in the King Kong 76. So that's what comes to mind immediately thinking back on, on my research on this film. I'm really disappointed in myself because I have the Morton book. I love the Morton book and I used it for Kong and Maiden. I don't know how I missed that. That's interesting. So I'm going to have to go and look at that. Okay, let's talk about, since we're already on the subject of the characters, let's talk about Linda Hamilton. I have to say, I love Linda Hamilton. <laughs> I'm a big fan of the the old school Terminator movies. I've been a little iffy on everything after Terminator 2. But the Linda Hamilton at this point was fresh off of the original Terminator. She was a rising star in my estimation at this point. So, she, and she's probably the best known actor in this film, I would say. And... <laughs> There are points where I'm watching her and I'm like, I feel a little bit sorry for you. You just came off a Terminator and now you're in this. And I don't know. Uh, My understanding is that she didn't necessarily have the greatest time making this movie. (laughs) Maybe I think a lot of the people who worked on this went into it thinking, oh, it's going to be a King Kong movie. It's going to be a big deal. And then they're like, what the heck is this? But they're like, well, (laughs) I got to finish the job. I even found a, a quotation where somebody said, the movie is really about the special effects. It's not about anything else. <laughs> yeah, this came from actor John Ashton. He said, quote, this movie is about Kong, about special effects, and about Jeeps being blown up. Acting is simply secondary in a picture like this, <laughs> end quote. Huh. And according to the Morton book, most of the actors didn't realize the film was a parody and played it straight or in the middle. Which is why I feel like the tone is uneven <laughs> in this film. The, because I think some of the actors thought it was supposed to be played straight and some thought it was supposed to be funny. I think that's where a big part of the problem comes into it for some people is because it, it, they probably feel like the movie can't figure out what it wants to be. Now, I will admit, yeah. watching the movie again, with this in mind, I can see where they were trying to do it that way. Because there are just certain parts of this movie you can't take seriously. And I'm not just talking about the stuff with the artificial heart and all of that. I mean, like when you get to the the courtship scene, (laughs) which I think even in your book, you mentioned it's like, hey, it's a kaiju romance. Nobody does this. (laughs) 
Yeah, that's I I just don't know how they could have done that without it being laughable or awkward. I I do think the score though transcends a lot of things and the score helps a great deal. Kind of is my take on it. Yeah. Well, you know what's funny? The scene and I it, <laughs> My live tweet when I saw this was, uh, you know, I, I said, I have now seen a gorilla sweep another gorilla off her feet. Now I've seen everything. <laughs> That's like, a good tweet. Yeah, because there's a scene where Kong rescues Lady Kong from captivity and literally picks her up in a bridal carry and runs out of the building. And apparently in the filmmaker's mind, the gag there was that it was supposed to be like Brett Butler and Scarlett O'Hara and Gone with the Wind. Huh. <laughs> Look, okay. <laughs> but then you have a scene that it is literally a romance scene with these two giant gorillas having moments together. And it's so weird. It is so weird. <laughs> can't, it's like you can't play it straight. I can't help but laugh at it just because of the sheer absurdity of it. But you can tell they are trying really hard to make these two characters and not just monsters. I think maybe the problem with me in this movie is I saw it as an impressionable kid. So I, I think to me it just wasn't as funny. Whereas people that saw it as adults, you know, it was maybe just way too out there. That that might be what the deal is with me. Yeah, possibly. I, I do think that nostalgia can do a lot for people's perceptions of certain things, as certain films or TV shows or whatnot. They, they act sometimes as rose-colored glasses, but I don't know. Uh, I've, there have been some things that I've discovered that were around back when I was a kid, but I just never got around to seeing them. But when I've watched them as adults, I have tremendous appreciation for them. So some things can transcend it. What did you think of the designs for these creatures? You've already talked about how you think that this is such an original concept. And I admit, I do like this idea. Again, on paper, this sounds like a great idea. But I have to admit, the first time I watched this film and I saw Lady Kong for the first time, who honestly just shows up in about seven or eight minutes into the movie and kind of out of nowhere, it's just, oh, cut to Africa. Hey, look, giant female gorilla. And there's one line of dialogue to explain it, which was they claimed at some point Kong's Island and Africa were part of the same landmass. I'm like, okay, that's a thin explanation, but it's an explanation at the very least. And I guess that, yeah. Lady Kong looks weird. <laughs> My first reaction when I saw it was, uh, hey, Lady Kong, put on a bra. <laughs> or that and, uh, how does this movie not have an R rating with all, of the, with all the gorilla boobs? It is strangely taboo it, when you think about it. it. It is a giant monster with breasts. I mean, it is, it is kind of odd. I don't, yeah. I, don't I, know. Will, I will tell you, though, as weird as this may sound, I did do a Google image search for female gorillas, and actually the, the design is not that far off. Yeah. So, but at the, no. regardless, it's still a little bit awkward, I think, because we're not used to seeing female gorillas in films. Yeah. But getting beyond that, what did you think of the creature design in this? I mean, to me, the, the creature design from King Kong, I know it's a new suit, but it's basically similar to the one from the 76 film. It's just the arms are longer so it can walk like a real gorilla, which was cool. But that's absolutely my favorite Kong design. I mean... I like it better than Kong Skull Island. I like it better than the Peter Jackson Kong. I like it better than the original. I feel like it's a very realistic suit, and I love it. I just love watching it. I definitely get bored with CGI sometimes, even though it's more realistic and the movement's a little more fluid sometimes. Uh, I just like the knowledge that those are real p people on real sets. Lady Kong, I like that they gave her some kind of lighter brown or red fur kind of they gave her some highlights. I thought that was interesting to differentiate her from King Kong. And um, now that I think about it, you talked about them not wanting to show clips of the movie. Uh, I realize now there's, whenever I look at publicity images of the movie, there's usually not any images of Lady Kong. So I think they were kind of embarrassed by her in the end, now that I think about that. Yeah, actually, I don't even think they had, uh, she's not on the poster or anything. I mean, she's central no, to the uh -uh. plot, but she's not there. It's always about King Kong. So you might have something there. I don't have my personal DVD copy of the film sitting here with me. I'd have to look at it to see if they even have publicity shots of her. I, I, I do. They, they, they do not. And I'm actually Googling uh, publicity shots and lobby cards, and I don't see Lady Kong anywhere. Wow. Which I think is interesting. 
Wow, that is interesting. Yeah, not, not a Lady Kong. Uh-uh. I'm looking at two lobby cards for King Kong 2. They've got the scene of Mitch standing in front of her feet in front of the reporters. They've got that. They've got Mitch and Amy at her feet, but they don't show her body in any of the publicity stills that I see. Mm, yeah, Maybe they were afraid of getting into a wee bit of trouble <laughs> with, with the yeah. censors because of it, because you know it can get a little bit dicey. This is a PG-13 movie, and they might have been able to get away with it because it's an animal, but I don't know. That's probably another good point to bring up is, you know, as a 10-year-old, I probably saw this when I was 10. My parents didn't let me watch, like, R-rated movies or anything like that, and they were a little reluctant to even let me watch King Kong Lives, but it was like King Kong, and I begged them. And it was kind of a shocking movie for me, too. I, I don't know that I'd ever seen a movie that bloody where Kong snaps the man in half, and oh. the other man, he bites him in half. Oh. And, so, I mean, for me, as a 10-year-old, that was another very visceral reaction, you know, because I just hadn't seen a monster movie that bloody. And that's even counting the Gamera movies. To me, their blood is not realistic. You know, like when Guren chops Space Gauss in half, it's there's no realism there to me. But like when Kong snaps the man in half and he eats the man, I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty intense for like a 10-year-old who'd never seen more explicit films. It's interesting that you bring that up because the whole scene with the rednecks – it's kind of a problematic element, I think, in this movie. It's weird. It is really weird. It, it, this notion that you have this great movie icon and he's suddenly been more or less incapacitated by a bunch of redneck hunters. <laughs> it's just, I've never thought of that. Never it's almost like, that, a, yeah. you know, oh, how the mighty have fallen sort of a thing. Yeah. I don't know. It. I will admit, it for me personally, anytime something redneck shows up in a movie or in a story in general, unless it's in my mind, done really well. It's a little difficult to swallow, especially when you're using such caricatured versions of rednecks in this. And Yeah, I don't feel like they portray the South very well in this movie. I mean, no. they, they do like to dote upon the rednecks. Yeah, well, and I... Well, actually, since you brought that up, I have to bring this up. When I was going through my live tweets in preparation for your visit here for this movie, this it has to be my favorite, which I wrote right after that scene where he eats the guy. <laughs> And I wrote, this was to be Kong speaking, and he says, Redneck meat's a little underdone and tastes like cheap liquor and cigarettes, but I was hangry, damn it. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I'm, I'm really proud of that one. When I was watching this, and it dawned on me, this was something that Ben Avery brought up in the episode on King Kong 76. Most of the deaths that Kong causes in that movie are accidental. But here, he is intentionally going out of his way and essentially murdering people. Now, mind you, they had harmed him beforehand, but still, he goes out of his way to find them and kill them after he gets away. Whether it's the rednecks or the military later, which I have to admit, that military battle at the end actually is pretty epic. And especially since we haven't really seen King Kong do something like that. You kind of get a little bit of it in the Japanese films, but even they didn't go to the extent that they go to in this one. I think that's exactly right. It's like it's like a scene from a Japanese monster movie, but actually done well. I know everybody's still about CGI, but like I like the physical props. To me, it's very realistic in its in its own strange way, and I think that's another reason why I love the film. Is that it was like a Japanese monster movie, but with better 1980s era effects because there weren't very many Japanese monster movies in the 80s, which I I think was actually a really good spot for practical effects. I think the 1980s was great for that because they were kind of at their zenith before CGI finally took over. So well, maybe that's another reason why I like the film. And I will admit, all the times that I've watched this movie, I'm still struck by that scene. In a way, it even kind of feels a little bit like an 80s action movie, doesn't it? You know, the, the hero is charging in against impossible odds and he's getting all bloodied and everything and he just keeps going and destroying his enemies and things like that. And it, it's exciting, I have to say. Absolutely. It's yeah. exciting. And the ending for it is a little, <laughs> is a little silly. <laughs> Where well, Kong literally about- pounds the general into his grave. <laughs> I was going to say, and then it's like, I swear that's a nod to Wizard of Oz because all you see is his feet sticking out of the grave. I swear that's what it's a nod to. <laughs> that's, a, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that, but still, I just thought it's, it's just like he's literally pounding the guy into his grave. Like, oh my gosh, movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. But 
you mentioned, you know, there's a lot of unique elements in this. You know, another thing that it dawned on me is, is unique about this that I haven't really seen anywhere else. The kaiju open heart surgery scene. I can't yeah. think of another movie other than, I think there's an anime, it's called Dragon Dentist or something like that. I haven't seen that yet. That's the only thing I can even think of that's remotely close to this. So you have this open heart surgery scene in a kaiju movie, on a kaiju. And they have essentially a giant claw machine. <laughs> I'm picturing the, the little aliens from Toy Story. He's like, that claw. Yeah. <laughs> it comes in and pulls out the, the regular heart, which, by the way, they actually researched real gorilla hearts when they made that prop. So they made it look like a real gorilla heart. And then the artificial heart, they said they completely made that up. That's a fantastical uh -huh. design. Although yeah. I thought it looked a little bit like a submarine. <laughs> So yeah, like, you put that. you put that in there. And I'm like, hey, how about we do uh, King Kong and Fantastic Voyage? That would have been great. <laughs> Toho toyed uh, yeah. with that with Godzilla in the 90s, but you know, <laughs> that whole scene was just was just really interesting to watch because I've never seen anything like it. It's a little bit mesmerizing, as crazy as it seems. I think that's actually one of the parts of the movie that works really well. It's probably one of my least favorite scenes, but it, to me, that's like one of the more boring scenes that you've got to get through to get to the good stuff. Because I, I don't know why I just like seeing Kong and Lady Kong running around in the wilderness and fighting the military and, and all that. Yeah, and that's the one thing that's markedly different about this compared to King Kong 76, the miniature work. You know, you had the stuff on the island, but a lot of the miniature work was for New York City, so it's a cityscape. And this one, it's it's out in the wilderness, I feel like that's another thing that fans can get hung up on that's kind of shallow in my opinion. It's like they don't like Godzilla versus the sea monster just because he doesn't smash a city. And I'm like, you know, I mean, the, the story for this movie really didn't call for Kong to smash a city or climb a big building. You know, I mean, I, I feel like the rural setting actually worked. When we were watching it, did you, or any other time that you've watched this, did you ever feel like that perhaps the filmmakers were inspired by Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid when they have Kong jump off the cliff into the river? I will concede that's kind of a bad shot when I watch it again, because I, I can definitely see that's just a normal human-sized man jumping off a real location, and it's it's not very convincing, yeah. Yeah, and also, it's, it's also, yeah. Well, what were you saying? Oh, as you say, it's just ludicrous that the water could be deep enough in that river that Kong would dive into it and not hit the bottom and hurt himself. And, you know, I mean, it's got to be a big, deep river. And I yeah. doubt. You know yeah. what else is kind of absurd? The fact that Kong bleeds what? like a leaky balloon <laughs> because yes. he bangs his head on the rock. And then they just see this yep. giant pool of red that just comes up. there. It's like, yep. OK, I know head wounds are you know, are deceptively nasty, but he bleeds like a leaky balloon. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of a running theme because at the end he bleeds a lot. The, just the like De Laurentiis the Kong bleeds a lot. Yeah. They like blood in the eighties. You know, they, they were deep into that gore. <laughs> well, they got to get that PG 13 rating, you know? Yeah. If the gorilla boobs don't do it, we got to put yeah. in the gore for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to backtrack really briefly here. Because I forgot to mention this, <laughs> but you know, we were talking about the scene where he's he eats the guy. When we watched it tonight, I had this thought. You know what this actually kind of reminds me of a little bit? War of the Gargantuas. Because oh yeah, gay yeah. Thing is, the tone was kind of all over the place with this one too, because they play it as being horrific when he breaks the guy in half and then he finds the one guy and eats him. After he eats the guy, they start playing it for laughs where he's chewing on the guy a little bit, and then he reaches in like he's picking his teeth, and then he pulls out the hat. And yeah. throws it aside. I'm like, I was thinking of the the scene of War of the Gargantuas where Gyra coughs up the dress that the woman yeah, he just ate yeah. was, from uh -huh. the woman he just ate. I'm like, oh man. Except I still feel like in War of the Gargantuas, they were if it was funny, it was supposed to be darkly funny, but it was still playing into the horror of the scene. Whereas this, I feel like they were subtly trying to make it funny. Yeah. Since we're talking about the tone, one interesting thing to note about this movie is that other than Son of Kong, this is currently, anyway, the only other sequel to a Kong movie in the Eighth Wonder's entire filmography. And we've been talking about this was meant to be a bit more of a parody, and it technically is in line with what Ruth Rose, the screenwriter for the original two movies, what she said when someone asked her, how do you make a sequel to King Kong? And she said, if you can't go bigger, go funnier. Yeah. And that was definitely true of Son of Kong. It was a funnier movie than the original. 
Yeah. Now that I think about it, it would have been an interesting nod, probably lost on a lot of people, but had, had the new baby Kong been port, born an albino, that would have been, I think, a unique nod to Son of Kong, because Kiko is, he's an albino, if I remember right. He is. Okay. Since we're, we're going to talk about the kid. I have some issues with the kid. <laughs> Mostly because too, the actually. design of the kid makes no sense. I feel like he should be bigger. I'm thinking... You know, he's what, like three feet tall, and you're telling me that giant Lady Kong was that pregnant and gave birth to that tiny thing? I concur one hundred. Yeah, it lost yeah. me. It completely lost me at that point. It's like that makes no sense. That must have been the easiest birth ever because that thing is small. Yeah. <laughs> and I again, yeah. I googled baby gorillas to see what they look like, and they are way bigger than that. <laughs> it's, at this point, why don't you just have her give birth to a normal sized gorilla? <laughs> yeah. Know, at that point, just, it doesn't yeah, work for that me. Even, yeah. it just, that even distracted me as a kid. I knew better than that. Yeah, it just, it does not work. I think they were banking, well, I think they were banking on a couple of things. One, interestingly, they had a little boy, a local boy from Wilmington, where they were filming this. They brought him in and they actually put him in that costume and had him play the part. And I'm thinking, where is that kid now? Because in some way, shape, or form, I'm hoping he got bragging rights for life. <laughs> yeah, I did not know that. That's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. the I can't, I'm trying to scour my notes to find his name, but I'll have Jimmy put it in his notes. I think they're banking on that. And the kid actually does a pretty good job, I would say. And I also think, related to that, I think they are banking on the emotion of the scene to carry it and hope that yeah. people don't think too much about how it doesn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, I'm kind of of two minds about it, but I just, it just doesn't work. Plus the design is a little weird, but while we're on that subject, an interesting thing I learned from your book was that there was a planned sort of sequel about the kid. There were two sequels in different formats. So Dino, you know, it's kind of funny. He goes to all this trouble to revive Kong. The movie's called King Kong Lives and King Kong Dies. So, <laughs> I, I mean, it's kind of ironic. You know, and again, he didn't just want to remake Son of Kong. That was a big thing that he didn't like. But yeah, I think they were thinking that potentially this could be a sequel and they could do sequels based on the kid. Supposedly, Ronald Shusett thought of this during production. Uh, his idea, it's... I kind of like it. I, I wish it had been made. Some of it sounds really terrible, but okay. So in my mind, this was kind of sort of maybe a little bit of a remake of Mighty Joe Young in some ways. And that's another interesting point is Dino De Laurentiis actually bought the rights for Mighty Joe Young from RKO. So that way no one could remake Mighty Joe Young while he was doing his Kong movies just because he didn't want any competition. But the idea was that it would be a teenage son of Kong. He would be about the size of Mighty Joe Young, because if you pay really close attention to the movies, Mighty Joe Young is just a little bit smaller than Kong. So he would have been about that size. Somehow he falls in love with a teenage girl. And for whatever weird reason, this teenage girl gets kidnapped by terrorists. And it's it's kind of like one of the scenes in Superman 2. I think there's a scene where Lois Lane, doesn't, doesn't she get held hostage in the Eiffel Tower? Do you, do you remember that, Nathan? Yes. Does that sound right uh, to you? I think that was... I don't think that was two. I want to say that was three or four. I'd have okay. to double check that. Okay, thanks, Jimmy. Yeah, he, he'll double check to make sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I, I assume she was inspired by that because those movies all came out before King Kong Lives, except for Superman 4. But anyways, the girl gets held hostage by terrorists in the Eiffel Tower, and this is what makes the story so comical. Uh, King Kong Jr. has a fear of heights. Can you believe that? <laughs> That's his story arc as a character. He's, he's afraid of heights. And this is what really gets me. Um, and I wonder about the logic behind this. Uh, he had a scene, allegedly, where Kong Jr. goes to the grave of his father, King Kong, and he uh, somehow m musters up the courage at the side of the grave. And he's then able to climb the Eiffel Tower and rescue his little girlfriend. And um, that's all I know. But what I really want to know is, why was this story set in Paris, other than he wanted him to climb the Eiffel Tower? How is Kong Jr. getting around like, Who's who's chauffeuring him from Kong's grave? And why wouldn't Kong's grave be somewhere in America? It almost makes me think that they came up with some convoluted re reason to have Kong's grave in Europe or something. If you know, I don't know. Something about that doesn't quite add up. But that's the crazy storyline for the alleged King Kong three, which obviously never happened because the movie bombed. And it bombed but hard. Yeah, 
It bombed yeah. hard. Actually, later on after this, we should talk about how its failure actually affected the Godzilla series in Japan, too. But we get to that after this. Again, De Laurentiis Entertainment really thought this would be a hit. And they also pitched a cartoon series to star. They called him Kid Kong. They pitched that to Filmation, who was doing, I believe, like the Ghostbuster cartoon in the late 80s and, and stuff like real that. real Ghostbusters. Yeah. Uh, an animator named Robert Lamb, a uh, really nice guy. I talked to him for the book. Such a nice guy. He shared his drawings with me. Um, I'm really indebted to him for that. They hired Robert Lamb to do some drawings. The producer from De Laurentiis Entertainment, it wasn't Dino himself. It was just one of the other producers. He wanted Kid Kong to have all sorts of superpowers. He was going to be able to grow or shrink in size. He was going to be able to shoot laser beams out of his eyes like the Hanna-Barbera Godzilla. He could fly. <laughs> He could even fly in outer space and go to other planets. I mean, this producer's ideas <laughs> were crazy. And, and Robert Lamb was the one who reined him in. And he was like, well, let's just set it on Earth and let's just give him one power. Because if he has too many powers, you know, he's way too powerful. So his Kid Kong superpower was that uh, he could grow or shrink in height. So that way he could be a human-sized character and, and interact with the other human-sized cast. Um, he was a genius. He built a submarine out of coconuts that was called the Coco Nautilus. <laughs> oh and, I mean, again, just remember, this is like a kid's a kid series. So, I mean, it was supposed to be out there and fun and fantastic. Well, it really couldn't actually be a sequel to King Kong Lives that's set in the real world. It would have been a more fantastical version of yeah, that. Yeah, that's, that's um, taking the fantastical elements and cranking it up to 12 at this point. <laughs> yeah, and another funny thing is the villains in the series harken back to the Kong 76. It was the Petrox Oil Company. I know. <laughs> they were the villains, yeah. No storylines actually got submitted. It was just a bunch of concept art for different vehicles and characters and villains. Yeah, so it would have been called Kid Kong. And again, I think just because the movie bombed, I don't know if they didn't do it because the movie bombed. Actually, the reason I read was De Laurentiis Animation would not give Filmation enough control of the project. So I don't think Filmation wanted to do it. And that's partly what collapsed it. Yeah, but, uh, that sounds wanna... all kinds of crazy. So yeah, King Kong gave birth to a superhero, a superhero monkey. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I... That almost would have been like if Toho or somebody back in the late 60s decided to make a Minya anime. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know how that would have been received. I think they, you shouldn't even get me started on this one, Nathan, because I think they did, because Toho in 1969 connected with Filmation to do a Godzilla animated cartoon. And then right after that, they did Godzilla's Revenge, which features Minya in a very prominent role. And, you know, Minya can shrink and grow in size. Oh, so no. I, I personally have a theory that had Godzilla had an animated cartoon show, I think Minya would have been very prominent. And I think that he very well could have grown and shrunk in size and communicated with the human characters on the show. That's just my own conjecture, but oh, wow. anyways, I and, should go down that rabbit hole. But yeah. Uh, and actually, now that you bring it up, didn't you say that Kid Kong's primary superpower would have been he could change size? That's right, yep. So he's he could. Minya on Fantasy Monster Island. That's he was, that's right. Crazy. <laughs> Yeah, it's but actually so King Kong King Kong lives has some very interesting Japanese aspects we can talk about. Yes, let's uh, do that. Number one, yeah, Brian Kerwin, the star, he said that he saw the Japanese version, you know, dubbed into Japanese, and he said that he preferred that version because it reminded him of a quote Akira Kurosawa film, which I think is funny. <laughs> yeah, I do so think actually, so too. I'm like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> And then, you know, actually Japan, they had high hopes for this movie. They called it King Kong 2, and they had two very notable video game tie-ins that were mm -hmm. kind of cool. And actually, Mechanic Kong kind of sort of is in one of the video games where King Kong has to fight these robot Kongs to save Lady Kong. I would love to play that video game if I could I, ever find I it. I actually but... wouldn't mind giving that a try myself. And let's not yeah, forget, yeah. let's not forget the amazing poster, Japanese poster yes, for this I movie. Oh poster. my gosh. That is 10 times better than this movie. <laughs> it's 10 times better than the American poster. The American poster is horrid. It, it looks like a cartoon. It it's is awful. It's silly. The, the American poster it, looks it is really cool. silly. Yeah. Had the Japanese poster been done first, I, I would think they would be smart enough to grab that and make it the poster internationally. But no, the, yeah, they had high hopes for the film, and it bombed in Japan too. And actually... 
that's partly the reason why, you know, we went from Godzilla 1984 to Godzilla versus Biollante in 1989. It wasn't just that the script was hard to, to develop. It was that when King Kong 2 came out in either 86 or 87 in Japan, uh, it just bombed really hard. And Toho apparently was like, oh, well, I guess giant monster movies are out right now. So we're not going to hurry too much on our Godzilla sequel. So it even found a way to really kind of screw over Godzilla fans, unfortunately. Which probably contributes to the ongoing animosity, I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah, between yeah, the two there's groups. definitely some animosity. Yeah. yeah, I feel like ever since the original King Kong versus Godzilla, both fan bases just keep biting at each other, so to speak. You know, pointing fingers at one another and putting some sort of blame on the other for screwing one or the other over. <laughs> yeah, I and, feel like it's a fun animosity in my opinion. I don't know. It can be. Maybe not. I've spent enough time on the internet to know that there are places where there's cesspools. But (laughs) yeah. (laughs) But that's the nature of the internet. (laughs) Yeah. Somebody who I like and I yeah who give a shout out to is that one of the bigger Kong YouTubers, Jack Buchanan, actually came to G Fest. He's a really nice guy. I like him. Yes. (laughs) Just as a quick side note, I'm really looking forward to G Fest. Well, not next year. This year. Yeah, this I'm, year. I'm really hoping to get out there. It'd be nice to have a little vacation from the island, you know, and be back yeah. in the States and hanging out with all of you guys. It's like Kaiju Mecca. <laughs> you know, yeah. G-Fest every year. Do you think you could bring Jimmy to do like a war on space panel? Do you think he'd do that? Uh, well, what do you think, Jimmy? <laughs> oh, well, I guess that is true. Somebody has to stay behind and take care of the studio uh, while true. I'm gone. I understand, Jimmy. I totally understand. <laughs> Someday, man. Someday. (laughs) Just to bring up something actually here really quick. It's interesting that Lady Kong actually is here on the island. Her and Kong don't hang out a whole lot, though. Mm. I think she's uh, still a little upset with his penchant for human women, particularly blondes. Yeah. So they pick little spots on opposite sides of the island and keep to themselves. Although, too bad. although interestingly, I do think Kid Kong and Kiko have a pretty decent relationship, you know, being half brothers and all. Unlike Minya and Baby Godzilla. I, yeah. I heard they used to didn't like each other, but I don't know if that's true. Well, Junior kind of thinks that Minya's a pansy. So, <laughs> uh, Well, they're all together in a little Toho TV series now. I don't know what it's like behind the scenes, but like... I think you've seen those little YouTube clips. I've seen some of them, yes. They're very amusing. I don't know. Something's going on there. As I was saying, I have a lot of notes about this film, weirdly enough. We don't have enough time for me to go into all of them, although I do have one last little tweet here from my live tweets I do want to share because it was this weird thing I noticed while watching this movie, and the tweet says, Ugh, King Kong never once beat his chest. One star. (laughs) But the baby does. I couldn't believe it. We get to this whole movie and King Kong himself never once beats his chest, even though he had several opportunities to do so. But at the end of the movie, we see the little baby do it. So that's a legitimate fan complaint there. (laughs) King Kong never beats his chest. (laughs) It's just so bizarre. Now, I'm being funny when I say one star just because of that, you know, but there are fans who will do stuff like that. Exactly. Yes, there are. It's just absolutely absurd. Other things should be evaluated and taken into consideration. Yeah. If you're going to give something one star, you better have more reasons than just that. Yeah. This is something we've been talking about a little bit, and it's something I've also brought up in a few of the previous episodes with some of my guests. Ray Morton specifically brings this subject up in his book when talking about this film, which is that he feels like resurrecting Kong for this movie robs the Kong myth of its power because the whole idea is that Kong is this tragic mythic hero and that perhaps there's only one King Kong story. And I feel like that's a little bit limiting, though I will admit it seems like filmmakers and storytellers have had more trouble coming up with, for whatever reason, coming up with more stories for King Kong as opposed to Godzilla. But I do think that's in large part because that first movie is just so perfect in its simplicity with that story that it's hard to follow it up. What do you think, John? Yeah, I would have to agree with that. I, I, It's one of those things where you can't have your cake and eat it, too. I, I guess the best thing would have been to go the Godzilla route and just discover a second King Kong for the sequels and let him carry that series like they did with Godzilla, I suppose. Possibly. 
I think there's more that you can do with King Kong. And I brought this up in that episode. I think King Kong Escapes actually illustrated that. You can do some different things with Kong. And if nothing else, as you have been pointing out throughout our discussion, King Kong Lives tries a lot of new things. Maybe some of them suffered in execution, but it's trying a lot of new stuff. I feel like the ending of, of that one's pretty powerful too, because it's like he just had his his son and then he dies two seconds later. I, I feel like that's a fairly impactful ending, you know? Yeah, I would agree with you. I do like the ending, getting past the baby Kong design, the kid Kong design, whatever you want to call him. But the emotion of the scene, I do think works. I think this sh- should just be taken as a challenge for storytellers to see if they can take King Kong and do some more things with him. If Toho can do it for Godzilla, come on, it's the eighth wonder of the world. You can do that with him. Yeah, absolutely. And with that, we will now move into (laughs) one of the more confusing aspects of the King Kong legend, that being his copyright in the Toku Topic. Okay, John, now we're moving on to, as I said at the beginning, the convoluted King Kong copyright, because one of the things that separates King Kong from other famous movie monsters, including his immediate competition, Godzilla, is that the intellectual property ownership of King Kong is a lot harder to figure out compared to Godzilla. We know for sure Toho owns Godzilla, but it it seems like King Kong belongs to everyone and no one. (laughs) <laughs> and yeah, I know that's, that's also something that you've yeah. talked about a little bit in your book. Yeah, and I, the big monkey wrench in that whole thing was Marion C. Cooper. Team. I mean, he was the the idea behind a giant gorilla, you know. He got the ball rolling on that, and then he brought in Edgar Wallace to help him write it. And then from Edgar Wallace's screenplay, there was the Delos W. Loveless novelization so it's like, okay, you've got Cooper created the idea of the giant ape and produced the film. Then you've got Edgar Wallace in there and, and the Loveless novel. And then RKO released the film. And basically because RKO released the film, they considered themselves to be the owners of Kong, whereas Cooper considered himself the owner of Kong, although Cooper also gave a few concessions to the Edgar Wallace estate about his contributions. But yeah, um, early, early on, Cooper wanted to make some additional King Kong sequels outside of RKO, which uh, the main one was Tarzan versus King Kong. And uh, he had some discussions with different RKO executives about, can I actually use Kong? Is that RKO? And so that's when, I mean, the argument about who owned Kong, that began really only a year or two after the first film was released in 1934. Well, and it's not only that, but as you and I talked about in brief when I had you on the first time, we were talking about continuation King Kong versus Godzilla and King Kong versus Frankenstein. Willis O'Brien also thought he owned King Kong somehow, which was really weird too. I I maybe, and it might be instead of he thought he owned Kong, it it might be that Willis O'Brien was pals with Cooper, and I think O'Brien figured, you know, I'm I'm Cooper's friend. He'll let me use King Kong. That might have also been the thinking as well. I'm not sure. I can see that, but because they corresponded a lot. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, my understanding is that the, they both really liked each other, despite the fact that they did clash oftentimes on set. <laughs> yeah. But I do think they had tremendous respect for one another. In order to really dive into this, I do want to lay a little bit of groundwork and talk a little bit about American copyright law before we get into this, because a lot of terms are going to get thrown around here related to this. So American copyright law was added to the U.S. Constitution in 1790 with the intention, quote, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries, end quote. Authors were granted exclusive rights to publish and sell, quote, maps, charts, and books, end quote, for 14 years with the option to renew them for another 14 years if they were still alive. Now, the law has been revised several times since then, most notably in 1831, 1909, 1976, interestingly, when the the previous Kong film was released, and 1998. And each time, the length of the copyright got longer. And currently, it now stands at 70 years plus the lifetime of the author, which I will admit seems a little bit crazy. 
<laughs> the, so essentially, if you write something, so, you know, in your case, John, we'll say, you know, you wrote Kong on Maid. Your copyright on Kong on Maid will last 70 years after you die. That's pretty extreme. Yeah. Yeah. I guess part of me does kind of wonders, like, what are you going to do with it after that? <laughs> Yeah, basically your your heirs will just fight over it, I guess. <laughs> Probably in one form or another. Oh man. And so copyright law pertains to what's called original works of authorship in any tangible medium of expression. And these can include literary works, so books, musical works, dramatic works with accompanying music. Pantomimes and choreographic works, which I find interesting. So I guess that means dance choreographers can huh. can copyright dance choreography. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I've done a lot of ballroom dancing in my day, so I kind of wonder about that <laughs> now, actually, now that I think about it. Pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works. Motion pictures and audiovisual works, which is what we're talking about here. Sound recordings. So my podcast is copyrighted to me. Architectural works. So that's interesting. So if you're an architect, your works are copyrighted to you. Really, Jimmy? The board of directors is trying to lay claim to my podcast? Uh, I'd love to see them try. Bring it on. <laughs> I'll fight you like Dino De Laurentiis. <laughs> now, a pertinent term to what we're going to be talking about here is what's called public domain. And public domain refers to creative works that are no longer protected by the laws governing intellectual property. The idea being that it now belongs to the public and anybody can use them. And there are four ways that this could happen. The most obvious way, which is a lot of what we're going to be talking about today, is the copyright just simply expires. So a lot of classic literature, Frankenstein, Shakespearean plays, things like that, they are no longer under copyright. They are considered public domain because the author has long since died and no one else has laid claim to him. Could also be that the copyright owner has failed to follow up on copyright renewal. The copyright owner deliberately places his work in public domain, which is known as a dedication, or copyright law does not protect whatever type of work that we're talking about here. So things like theory. So if they have a scientific theory, you can't necessarily copyright that. And in this case, when we're talking about King Kong, you've already mentioned some of the things that was going on at the beginning of it. It really gets ramped up in the 70s because what happened was when the Lovelace novelization was published, that was 1932, so a year before the movie's out. And at that time, copyright lasted for 28 years. The copyright for that novelization was never renewed, so it expired in 1960. And then what happened was when De Laurentiis was trying to get the ball rolling for the 76 remake, Universal, as we were hinting at before, his nemesis, was also trying to make a movie. And then because there were these two competing projects, De Laurentiis got into a huge legal battle with Universal. Yeah, so Universal, I think it started with the novel. If I remember right, it might have been Jim Danforth, who had done the, the stop motion effects on When Dinosaurs Ruled the Earth, he had been wanting to remake King Kong since, uh, I think, 1974 or 72. And I think it was he who brought this to Universal that there was possibly a loophole due to the copyright lapse on the novel. And that's why when Universal on their project, The Legend of King Kong, they could never do anything that was in the movie, but it wasn't in the book. Like King Kong's fight with the T-Rex, that was original to the movie. It's not in the novelization. I believe in the novelization, he fights the Triceratops. And so that's why in the legend of King Kong, he fights Triceratops. Now, it didn't hinge entirely upon the novel. Universal, you know, it's very confusing. Uh, you could write a whole book on this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, what, what made Dino win out in the end? Um, now, Universal they still would have had to have paid something to RKO, but it was just basically Dino offered to pay them more. He, he was willing to give them more money and a percentage of the film's actual gross, and that's why he won. And Universal, if, if I'm not mistaken, they still had the option to make the film after Dino finished his film, but they realized, you know, if he's going to beat us to it, you know, there's no point in that, so they gave up. What happened, though, in the late 1970s, it finally came to a head. The Cooper estate, headed by Richard Cooper, which was Marion C. Cooper's son, 
I don't know all the details, but Richard Cooper and the, the Cooper estate, they actually did win in court the rights to King Kong. They proved that RKO did not deserve those rights. Cooper deserved those rights. But then ironically, what happened is Cooper, once he got the rights, he immediately sold the film rights to Universal. I know. And Mary, yeah. And so Cooper, all he kept was publication rights. So today, if you see the King Kong novelization in print, the Cooper estate is who's getting the money from that. And that's why any King Kong print materials, that's licensed to Cooper. But film licensing was Universal. That's why they had the Universal King Kong ride. That's why eventually Universal did the King Kong remake as well. Yeah, the Peter Jackson film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, as Ben Avery pointed out, in a way, Universal made it out easy with this. They essentially got paid money to not make a movie. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> uh, my understanding is that the, the whole thing got started because RKO was very good about keeping King Kong from being remade. They had a no remake role, and that was in large part because of Marion C. Cooper. He didn't want people remaking the movie. There was a whole to-do about the Japanese films and how those came about. That's a whole other can of worms that is kind of related to this. But when Marion C. Cooper died in 1973, it sounded like RKO was a little willing to relax their no remake rule. And that's when De Laurentiis approached them to remake it. And then, yeah, all the stuff that you were talking about was supposed to be that it was a verbal agreement. And then there was all this talk about what does a verbal agreement actually mean? And when Universal found out, it seemed like they were going with De Laurentiis instead of them to do the remake. They then sued for $25 million in damages. Yeah. saying that Archeo had done a breach of contract and that they were guilty of fraud, and they accused De Laurentiis of international interference with advantageous business relations and unfair competition. Wow. <laughs> all, all because of all this, you know, supposedly there was a verbal agreement, and there was a lot of miscommunication and studio politics and everything related to that, and it's incredibly difficult to try to unravel. As I said in the previous episode, you could write a whole book about these shenanigans that were going on. There was so much confusion. Yeah, and I still don't understand how it works where Kong Skull Island started out at Universal with Legendary. Legendary Universal were co-producers and somehow, I, I don't know, Legendary bought them out of it so they could do it within the Godzilla universe. And then there's a whole thing supposedly that that's why it's called Kong Skull Island and he's never really called King Kong. Yeah, I kind of wondered That's something I'm not clear that. on. Yeah, I wonder yeah, about that Yeah, I am not myself. clear on how that works at all. I have yeah. no clue. And again, we're not getting Godzilla versus King Kong. We're getting Godzilla versus Kong. Yeah. I don't know how that works. Yeah. And what's funny is it sounds like De Laurentiis was surprised by this whole thing. But he thought he was in the right because he had a signed contract. So he just kept going on making his movie. <laughs> it, and it's also one of those deals where it's what not what you know, it's who you know. And he yes. was friends with, yeah, the guy who owned RKO. Because RKO by then as a film company was defunct, but they were owned by the General Rubber and Tire Company. I know, who owned so the RKO weird. library. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's almost like you could almost make the argument that some tire and rubber company at one point owned King Kong. <laughs> exactly. You could. It's so weird. It is so weird. I don't know. I would love to see a history of RKO as a company and just like, how does that all work? <laughs> yeah. It's probably one of those package deal things where it's like, if you want to gain this asset, you got to buy everything else. You know, kind of like how Scholastic, I think it was at one point owned Ghidorah, the three headed monster. <laughs> Oh, really? Oh, like the VHS right yeah. to the uh, the movie? I yeah. had forgotten about that. Yeah. I had completely forgotten that. Yeah, it, it's, it's probably one of those weird things. But when this whole thing was going on, Universal honestly thought that their ace in the hole, when they were doing The Legend of King Kong, which was their production, and they were going to actually set it in 1933, make it a period piece. So they thought their ace in the hole was that they said, hey, we can use the novelization. It's in public domain because the copyright expired. Ha! Ha! <laughs> Yep. So they said, our movie's going to be based on the novelization. You can't get us. So yep. for a brief time, there were two movies in production. But in the meantime, they were all filing counter lawsuits. So RKO filed a counter lawsuit against Universal, and it went to the federal district court, and it was for $5 million for copyright infringement. <laughs> and they filed an injunction for the studio to stop pro uh, promoting their movie. De Laurentiis filed his own suit for $90 million in damages for copyright infringement and unfair competition. <laughs> and he filed an injunction on Universal. <laughs> and then Richard Cooper stepped in into the middle of all of this. And then he got involved with it because he thought that his father still owned all the rights. So it was a 
just a giant mess. So it essentially turned into this race between Universal and De Laurentiis to who could start production first. The idea being that whoever started production first would get their movie made because the market couldn't really support two King Kong movies at the same time. <laughs> yep, that's that's part of it. Yeah. Supposedly Universal approached De Laurentiis about settling after he announced he had started filming, they discussed doing a joint production, but De Laurentiis didn't like Universal's demands, which is that they wanted their script to be used, and they wanted merchandising and sequel rights. Finally, Paramount, who was distributing the 76 version, went to De Laurentiis and said, you need to settle this or we're pulling out. <laughs> so then after untangling all of these claims and counterclaims, the judge ruled that all rights to the name, character, and story of King Kong other than those of RKO's films belong to the Cooper estate and all profits they earned from it were to be awarded to Richard Cooper. And then, like you said, Richard Cooper then sold the rights to Universal, keeping the publishing rights. And I think now RKO's library is owned by Warner Brothers, isn't it? Uh, last I checked. Oh, that's right. So yeah. maybe that ties in a little bit to Kong Skull Island. Yeah, because that was Warner, Warner Brothers. Warner that, Brothers. Yeah, it was Warner Brothers who distributed that. So essentially... The rights to King Kong were split up between RKO, which is now part of Warner Brothers, Dino De Laurentiis, Universal, the Cooper Estate, and then there are parts of it that are in public domain, which is why you see a lot of unlicensed Kong material <laughs> floating around. But you have stuff like Queen Kong and a lot of the Kong-related knockoffs that came about because of Kong Mania, which mm -hmm. going back to King yep. Kong lives a little bit here. I wonder if, you know, there's a scene where they were talking about Kong Mania being a thing when they, you know, all these people who are huge fans of Kong and they're hearing that Kong's being brought back to life and all of that sort of stuff. I wonder if that was a bit of a reference to that. Could have been, yeah. But then the next crazy chapter of this whole thing, and this has become one of the most infamous lawsuits for what I understand in, I guess, copyright history because of how absurd it was and how quickly it got thrown out, which was Universal versus Nintendo over Donkey Kong. <laughs> Have you heard anything about this, John? I know enough about it to be dangerous, but I don't know enough to really talk about it in detail. Okay, I've got some details here for you. I need to see if you can fill in some for me if you know anything else. So, have you ever heard of Shigeru Miyamoto? That would be the creator of Mario himself, right? Yes. Yeah, he was a programmer over at Nintendo. He's created a lot of their big games, including Mario. He also created Donkey Kong. He does admit that the game was inspired by King Kong. In fact, when they were first working on the game in the late 70s, early 80s, they used King Kong as a placeholder before they settled on the name Donkey Kong. Obviously, the game is a little bit similar. You have an ape that kidnaps a young woman, climbs a tower, and the player character, Jumpman, who later became Super Mario, has to rescue her. So, so there's at least some surface-level similarities there. The game was released by Nintendo in 1981, and it was a huge hit. Sold 60,000 units and earned the company $180 million. And we're talking $180 million, 1981 dollars, Okay. Nintendo was cutting deals to port the game to other platforms. And that's when Universal got wind of it. And guess what? They started suing everybody over it. So they bullied Coleco and Tiger Electronics into paying them damages because they were porting the games to their consoles. In fact, I can remember growing up playing the, the Intellivision. There was an Intellivision port of Donkey Kong. It's awful, but <laughs> that was my introduction to Donkey Kong. And then they insisted, this is the irony of it, they insisted that they owned the rights to King Kong and that gamers would get King Kong and Donkey Kong mixed up. During the litigation, I love this, during the litigation for all of this, the judge realized that in Universal's previous lawsuits, they had argued that no one owned the intellectual property rights to King Kong, and now they were claiming that they did. That's hilarious. They kind of remind me of Toho in a way. Toho will claim any type of giant dinosaur uh, is like Godzilla, and notoriously the Subway commercial, which I didn't think resembled Godzilla that much. But yeah, so yeah. that's funny. <laughs> Writer Timothy Geigner put it this way, and I love this. Quote, with one hand, they were hitting Nintendo over the head with the IP hammer while holding a shield against another IP hammer with the other. <laughs> <laughs> end quote. So I'm just picturing Universal trying to run up to all these other companies like Mario in Donkey Kong smashing things with a hammer. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then obviously you know, the lawsuit just got thrown out at that point because 
<laughs> it just said, you got nothing. You have absolutely nothing on this. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It's, it's weirdly entertaining, I have to say. Just the irony of it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Anything you could add to that? Not on. I love Donkey Kong games. I halfway thought about my King Kong book putting in the unmade Donkey Kong games and like an <laughs> appendix, but I was like, no, nah, that's a little too out there. I don't think that fits. <laughs> that would have been amusing, I will say. <laughs> Maybe whoever makes another Kong-related anything, they need to put a little tie on King Kong like Donkey Kong Dad has now. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be funny. Just to kind of stick it to, to Universal and Nintendo or something, just to be funny. <laughs> yeah, but it, it hasn't stopped there. There have been some other litigation and things, some, some more minor things, I would guess, since then. You had uh, Joe DeVito, who was the author of a novel, I believe, or is it a comic? Is that what it is? It actually might be both, a novel and okay. a comic at this point. We'll have to ask Jimmy yeah. later. Yeah, he agrees. He'll look into that. But it's called Kong King of Skull Island. And this guy, when the movie Kong Skull Island came out, he tried to sue Legendary Pictures as he claimed that he had created the Skull Island universe. Which doesn't Which is, that by extension yeah. mean he created the monster verse? I mean that you, you start getting you can start getting into some really crazy things saying that at this point. Because yeah, and Skull I, and Island I mean, the know, film is that. not its own thing. <laughs> it's part of the monster verse. Yeah, and I mean that's like Joe DeVito. I get what he's getting at, but it's kinda like, you know, Marion C. Cooper created Skull Island and DeVito just built upon that, you know, so that's that's another way that it's kind of murky. Yeah. DeVito's attorney, Randy Merritt, put it this way, quote, more than 80 years have passed since the public was introduced to Marion C. Cooper's King Kong. In that entire time, not one motion picture or television program has told the story of the iconic creature's origin or his relationship to the mysterious island on which he was found, end quote. I haven't read King of Skull Island yet, so I'm guessing that's what the, the story of it is about. So something of an origin story for Kong? That's right. And then there was also a film project in, in competition with Kong Skull Island called Skull Island, The Blood of the Kong. And that was by, I think, Neil Marshall and somebody else. And it was going to be a prequel where pirates crash land on Skull Island and the natives are like breeding these giant apes. So there would have been multiple Kongs. And then I'm not sure what exactly happened there. I, I think just Skull Island you know, Legendary's version canceled that. And then amidst all of this as well, there's talk of a TV series called Skull Island, which I don't know how the legalities for that work either. You know, and I think that's probably been canceled by now because it's been, it would be in development for like two years or more. So I'm, I'm assuming that's not going to happen. I have to say, Blood of the Kongs actually sounds really interesting. I would have actually been excited to see that. Yeah, that does sound interesting. This is why, like I said, because of how murky all of this is, that's why you see the name Kong showing up a lot. You know, the there's actually mm -hmm. a brand of dog collar or, or dog products. It's called Kong. Yeah. And you have Donkey Kong. I mentioned before you had Queen Kong, the, which was one of those King Kong knockoffs that came around in the mid to late 70s after the 76 version. That name can get used, it seems like, by anybody, anywhere. It's just, it just gets thrown around all the time. Interestingly, though, and I wonder how they got away with this, but there was a, a pro popular professional wrestler for a while back in the 80s named King Kong Bundy. <laughs> you can get it thrown around as much as you want and probably just say, well, we claim the novelization because that's the part that people can point to and say, we're just using that. Yeah, it's crazy. It's definitely maybe gotten a little out of hand there. I don't know. Well, and then, uh, what is it? Uh, there's been some animated series that use the name Kong. You know, had like Kong King of Atlantis. And I think there was something on Netflix. It was an animated series for a while. Yeah, and I, I, I want to know, like, who's getting the money on those? The Cooper Estate, Universal? Is nobody getting money off of that? I, I have no clue. It's just one of those things. Intellectual property law can get really hairy. Yeah. There's a lot of things that are going around. You have a lot of big studios. I think this is where it starts to get really crazy when you start having these big corporations that are laying claim to a lot of these things. You have stuff like there's a lot of infamous stories out there about music companies and film studios that are coming down on YouTubers for using samples of their stuff in mm -hmm. what in their videos and all that because YouTube has an automated system that will flag it or take it down or things like that because so much power has been given to the rights holders that I think sometimes they abuse that power and I think they're starting to get more stringent about it and with King Kong it's so hairy 
you know, it's such a mess. I don't think anybody can honestly really untangle it because at that point it just turns into, well, who are you going to pay this to? You know, do you give it to Universal? Do you give it to the Cooper State? Do you give it to Warner Brothers? Do you, I mean, there's just so much. Yeah, I have no idea. And that's one reason with my Godzilla books, I never do pictures because Toho is very clear on that. But King Kong, they're not so clear. And also, you know, the images I used were mostly publicity images. There's kind of a difference when it comes to posters and things that are meant to advertise as opposed to private behind the scenes stills and things like that. You know, Toho doesn't even want you using a poster. But I felt like, you know, with King Kong, it was maybe a little more lenient. I know. And that's actually one of the things I think is really cool about your book, Kong on May. You got all those images in there and i think it it adds a lot to the the book being able to see all of these things it's a lot more fun and i'll, I'll stress it again you know the image on the cover isn't really of king kong it's of a giant ape from a movie called the lost island that was a spoof of king kong but it, it never got finished and i can't even remember who was making it but that studio doesn't even exist anymore you know so i was still careful but um, I felt like on the inside to use a few posters and advertising materials wouldn't be like a, a big deal. Hopefully you know, it's not. And see, and that's another thing that's interesting about this. You know, you talked about that material that you were using is from a studio that doesn't even exist anymore. So at that point, who really owns the copyright if the studio isn't even around anymore? Yeah, and that's another tricky thing. You know, they've got like movies from Shinto. You know, I thought Shintoho didn't exist, but I think this is really ironic. Recently, Toho is in talks to buy the people who bought the Shintoho library. I think that's really funny because they made some movies like Woman Vampire and Fearful Attack of the Flying Saucers. So uh, I think presumably in the future, Toho is about to own even more Tokusato movies. <laughs> oh, jeez. Toho is quickly becoming the Disney of Japan at this point because they own so much. They are, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, that, that'll be what we'll hear about next is Toho bought Gamera. That would be funny. Oh, geez. <laughs> that would be... <laughs> buy it from Katakawa. Is that who owns him now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Katakawa. <laughs> oh, jeez. That would be crazy. I think the fans would rejoice at that point because they're like, yay, Godzilla versus Gamera. Yeah. <laughs> you know something funny? I was on... It was a big radio show. It was kind of born off of Coast to Coast AM. I think it's called Midnight in the Desert or something. And towards the end of our interview, we kind of ran out of things to talk about. And we, we actually even started talking about Kong versus or Godzilla versus Kong, the new one. And the host, he claims that he has it on good authority that because he has connections. He has it on good authority that Gamera will actually be in Godzilla versus Kong or that there's nods to Gamera in the movie or something. So that I guess time will tell. <laughs> Careful with that, John. The Monster Island Board of Directors has banned all spoilers and leaks for oh, that movie. So okay. <laughs> okay. since this is hearsay at this point, I think you're safe, but they can get a little bit crazy. So just letting you yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. I didn't know that. Yeah. Do you have anything else, John, before we wrap up? I believe that's everything. I, I've enjoyed it. And, um, you know, if Jimmy will give me a tour of the garage and I can see that mechanic on he's rebuilding, maybe we can patch things up. <laughs> Oh, sounds like he's up for that. Okay, well, good. That's yeah, it. I would love to see you two reconcile. I don't like seeing people get upset with each other like this. Well, you know, redheads need to stick together, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, you're a very small portion of the population. Yeah, and we have no souls. So, I mean, we should get along. I don't see what the problem is, but... Yeah. <laughs> All right, any shameless self-promoting you would like to do before we sign off? Ah, just again, you know, if you like Kong Unmade and you're really crazy about it, you know, there is not, it's not a second edition, but it is a hardback edition. So it's really got that retro feel. I did redesign the interior. So the interior is very retro 1970s library book as well, even more so than that, the soft cover I did. And there is also a second edition totally overhauled tons of new content version of the lost films it's called the mutated edition so you know just just look around on amazon you'll find them both pretty easy all right and just to let listeners know the episodes for the coming month the next mini sode after this will be a mini analysis of varan the unbelievable found out some interesting things about that film and then our next big film discussion we're skipping ahead almost 20 years to 2005 to talk about Peter Jackson's extremely epic King Kong remake. And joining me for that will be none other than my G-Fest co-panelist and creator of the Godzilla novelization project, Danny DeManna. No, Jimmy, I would prefer that 
that episode not be as long as the movie, especially since people already complain about the length of Peter Jackson's King Kong. Oh, boy. <laughs> you got to work really hard to make three-hour podcast episodes interesting. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But with that, I'll let you and Jimmy take that tour, and I need to go start getting ready for those next episodes. So, cue credits. Thank you for listening to the Monster Island Film Vault, a podcast produced and hosted by Nathan Marchand. If you enjoy the show and want to join the discussion, we'd love to hear from you. So email us at feedback at monsterislandfilmvault.com. Your message could be read on a future episode of the show. Our website is monsterislandfilmvault.com. Follow us on Facebook at Monster Island Film Vault and on Twitter, where our handle is the Monster Isla One. You can also follow Jimmy from NASA on Twitter at NASA Jimmy. I have fulfilled my contractual obligations. The podcast logo was created by Tyler Souls from TylerDrawsComics.com. Our theme song is Wander on the Offensive, live edit by B33J, Sarax, Juan Madrano, and Nonsensical Lexus which is a remix of Counter-Attack, Battle with the Colossus, and The Open Way, Battle with the Colossus by Ko Otani from the video game Shadow of the Colossus. It can be downloaded from ocremix.org. All film and audio clips belong to their respective copyright holders, and no infringement is intended or implied. The show is available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, and other fine podcatchers. Please rate and review the podcast to help spread the word about the show. The Monster Island Film Vault is a Moonlighting Ninjas Media production. Sayonara! <laughs>